Hi everyone, my name's Matt. Um, I'm the Chief Executive of the Tauranga Chamber of Commerce. This is traditionally our annual City Leaders Lunch that we hold at Trinity Wharf Hotel. Because of the circumstances, uh, we really tried to hold it there, but in absence of uh, having a lunch, we thought we would do a broadcast to our whole database and uh, get these city leaders to address you um, yeah, at these uh, shared workspace office uh, at 65 Chapel Street. A big thank you to uh, Audio Solutions who are helping us with this vi uh, video footage, and we're looking forward to um, giving you the latest information. If you are uh, wary of what what uh, businesses should be doing and ca uh, catching up with the latest information about COVID-19, please visit our website, www.tauranga.org.nz. We will be keeping that up to date daily. There are lots of tips and advice, as well as how to get in touch with our business advisors. Uh, it's free to meet with them, and it's a great support network that all the businesses should at least uh, check out. Uh, we are here, um, we're going to hear for the last, uh, well, from three speakers today. First speaker will be uh, MP for the Bay of Plenty, Todd Muller. He'll be followed by uh, Western Bay of Plenty Mayor Gary Weber, as well as Dave Courtney, who's the head grower, and, who's the head of grower at Zespri, chief grower, I should say, um, at Zespri. Uh, then we'll, we'll follow up with a panel discussion and I think uh, it'll be pretty interesting. We will cover off both uh, the immediate situation as well as perhaps looking forward uh, over the next 12 and 24 months. Uh, I look forward to hearing your feedback. If you do have any questions, please do get in touch with us. Good afternoon. My name's Todd Muller. I'm the local uh, MP for the Bay of Plenty, uh, and uh, I was looking forward to uh, talking, of course, at the City Leaders Lunch to a group of 100. Uh, but remarkably, this opportunity, uh, both reflective of our current environment, is actually uh, uh, even better because I understand there's four or 5,000 uh, in the Chamber uh, uh, database reflecting the strength of that organisation. And so some of my uh, reflections today, hopefully, uh, can get to a wider audience. Uh, can I first acknowledge Matt and the Chamber team? Uh, I have been in this community now for, uh, well, in a professional context for about 20 years, personally for nearly 50, but the Chamber of Commerce has been a huge part of the Tauranga story of progress and achievement in a uh, commercial and business context because they've been there uh, as advocates for uh, now many decades, and I just want to acknowledge their continual uh, effort. This is, of course, challenging. Uh, times for this community of Tauranga but the wider country. Uh, and of course I wasn't intending to start with uh, in my speech when I was thinking about it a couple of weeks ago uh, with uh, COVID-19. Uh, but clearly uh, events have transpired over the last uh, few days or weeks <coughs> to make it necessary to reflect on some of those issues. Uh, we are in unprecedented times. I mean you have them in your life. I can remember Princess Diana, uh, I can remember 9-11. Uh, they're probably the two standouts for me uh, in terms of events that when they occur you get a sense that um, New Zealand will be slightly different because of it. Uh, and for me this is clearly going to be one of those issues. Uh, we have got already to the point of closing our borders, which for a country that has built over two centuries a tradition of creating value to export to the world and relying on the people-to-people -people connections which enable them, that is an extraordinary position to find ourselves in. Uh, but I do support the government's approach that they have taken to this. Of course, as an opposition MP, I could find fault on aspects around timeliness or you know the scale of testing, but I think you'd agree with me that the size of the scale that confronts this country at the moment uh, calls for us actually to look collectively at ways that we can get through it. There'll be time in to come to review and identify what's not worked, but right now, in my opinion, what is more important is to stand beside the government and look for ways to support them. So yes, the border has been closed, and yes, like you, I suspect uh, that next week, uh, perhaps even when you're listening to this, further measures would have been put in place uh, to further change our day-to-day -day life in ways that only weeks ago we couldn't imagine. Yes, I expect school closures are around the corner. 
And potentially, if this uh, virus takes hold in this country as it has in others, we may see uh, um, communities asked to stay at home, to be locked down, which I know as business operators is just a concept which is impossible really to get our heads around. Uh, and those uh, actions will be necessary. They'll be informed by the best science, the best advice, uh, and uh, the Prime Minister and the Government will be making judgments based on uh, those uh, advice. And <coughs> like I say, I think what we should do is, is look uh, to support it. But it does raise the question from a <coughs> business perspective around, so how can we possibly operate uh, when we're in these uh, uh, unprecedented times? Well, I think one of the key things is to look at the technology, like this today, uh, our ways around how we can connect with people, uh, firstly our key people, which is our families and the people that we love to make sure they're safe and looked after, but beyond that, people who are important to our wider business interests. How are they feeling? Uh, are they safe? Is there anything I can do as a, as a person, beyond your business opportunity, to be supportive of them? And we have technology at our disposal to connect quite intimately with people, even if they're quite far away. I think we should be thinking proactively of what we can do uh, with the technology available to us to stay connected to the people that care for us. And included in that, of course, is how we can stay connected with our uh, key customers, both uh, here in this community uh, and wider. You know, I think this is a time that New Zealand will look back on and realise that however this lands, we will be different because of the experience. It is going to force us into a degree of isolation that will make us reflect on what we need to do to make our businesses more resilient and how we can use the technologies such as what I'm talking to you through today in a way that can enable our businesses uh, to be stronger. I don't know what that looks like, but I have a sense that we will get through this and we'll get through it together because we have got some phenomenal natural advantages. Our isolation, which in past has been such a challenge for us, I think ultimately will be a benefit. We produce high quality value food, uh, fibre uh, and services to the world. Uh, what we can see with the China experiences as they come through this uh, horrific experience that they've had, they are returning back to a normalcy which is a strong design and desire for New Zealand product and services. I expect that to continue and I expect that over time to be replicated uh, across the world and indeed across the, this community and the people that you do business with. So I think the medium term is optimistic, it's how of course we get through um, uh, the short uh, term challenge. I think looking at, for opportunities to work together uh, as businesses is important. This morning I was talking to leaders of the meat industry. Uh, and they were reflecting on what they can do together to help capacity constraints uh, that is already existing in their current uh, meat works, but potentially will become even more so if um, uh, some of their production gets impacted by the coronavirus. I've signalled personally to Damien O'Connor, my opposite, the government minister, as of yesterday, that the time for partisan politics in, in my portfolio has ended. And he has my support to be able to work with him to identify how possibly we can get through this because actually when I look at kiwi fruit, when I look at um, horticulture more generally, when I look at our food processing sectors, they are going to come under huge pressure if we have a scenario where our community gets locked down. In other countries, those sectors are considered critical resources and critical industries. That must happen here, uh, but what I think is important is that I look along with my fellow national MPs who have a rural and agriculture uh, portfolio and, and uh, uh, interest to ensure that we can stand alongside the government at this time, assisting them in what will be a very, very difficult process to navigate. Uh, so I think you as your own businesses have that sort of opportunity. Yes, you are no doubt highly competitive with others in your same space, but they now will be in the same circumstances. What can you do to be able to connect with them to perhaps just create the environment where the revenue is still possibly able to be captured, certainly in the short to medium term. I think you're going to hear shortly from two of our um, uh, leaders. Uh, Gary Webber will follow. He is the Mayor of the Western Bay of Plenty. And I think you have seen over the last uh, few weeks 
strong efforts by the Western Bay of Plenty, Tauranga City and the Regional Council to find ways of being more uh, collaborative uh, and to uh, join together and be more joined up in terms of their approach to infrastructure funding and development in the city. This was going to be a key part of what I was going to talk about. Um, my point here is collaboration is everywhere. It's the sort of thing that can often uh, 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 can have lip service. It's quite difficult. To do it well, you have to concede aspects of your own priorities and your own interests uh, to merge it into something which is larger than the sum of its parts. This region needs to do more of it. Our city leaders, uh, both Gary, um, uh, Tembe and of course um, uh, our uh, Doug Leader from Regional Council should be commended for the effort that they're doing but I'd ask them to do more of it uh, because actually the extent to which they can have a unified vision of how this community should grow, uh, the infrastructure needs that are required to enable it, how to fund it, is an important part of us being able to get our infrastructure supported over time. We cannot afford to have too many voices with too many different opinions around the future of the city because no central government is going to stand beside a fragmented community if you don't know what your strategic priority should be. And that requires leadership. That's not easy. Uh, I commend the councils for embarking on this journey and I wish them uh, to go harder and faster. Uh, finally, of course, kiwifruit, the sector that I have uh, essentially has been my history. My parents bought a Chinese gooseberry orchard 50 years ago. I appreciate they're under huge pressure at the moment going through a harvest. That may well have quite a lot of pressure in terms of people uh, picking kiwifruit and being there for it. I know they're working very hard to ensure that the opportunities that exist in that sector right now to help them harvest is communicated widely. Uh, we all need to pitch in here because actually to get that fruit off harvested and off to the markets of the world will be a three billion dollar boost to our economy nationally and a lot of that comes here locally and so we need to swing in behind that industry uh, and all of us uh, see the opportunity to be able to stand behind those who are strong uh, because it will all help all of us to get through uh, the next few weeks. Thank you very much and I look forward to uh, the question and answer session uh, that is to come. Thank you. Tanui Tamiti, Kia Koto, Tanak Rangatira Me, Kaitiaki Otarai. Greetings to you all. Um, although you're not in the room, it's great to have you on the other side of the camera. But I just referred to you as the leader, leaders and guardians of our district. I acknowledge Todd and Matt and um, Anne from the chamber uh, for putting this together. I think we've, we've found a solution, as Todd's just referred to. Using technology is something we're going to have to get used to. When I was asked initially by Anne to cover off on it was the issues of infrastructure and the plans we have to go forward. And I know many would have the view of how we'll get it out, but I'd just like to share with you mine. At the beginning, as I said, it was about three or four weeks ago. COVID-19 was an anagram that none of us really knew what it was all about. But as sure as hell, we know what it's about now. We are heading into uncharted waters and it's going to take all of us to stand shoulder to shoulder to work our way through this. But the underlying advice from the health people is wash your hands, if you feel ill, self-isolate, but most of all, don't panic. And in reality, don't watch Facebook because that may mislead you. Our regions faced adversity before. Not so long ago, Fakari went up the Edgecombe floods, the Edgecombe earthquake. In relatively recent times, we've been through those events and we've come out the back end of them, as Todd just referred to, stronger because we've learnt from them. We've put new processes in place on how to face up to adversity. And, and this is just another one we have to work our way through. Unfortunately, I think COVID-19 will be with us for longer because we're getting a, a, almost a tourist inborn uh, issue now, but we also have to face our flu season, which is for us July through to September. But again, it's just something we have to manage our way through. So back to those original issues that Dan asked me to talk about. I'm sure you don't need reminding. Traffic congestion and housing issues are the two big problems we have in our district and we have to address them. 
For much of my career, I was involved in automation and computerization of, of business practices. Um, I was the chief executive of New Zealand's fastest growing dairy company in the late 80s, early 90s. I spent some time in Japan representing the New Zealand dairy industry. And I, my last real job was running Fonterra's milk collection operations. Annual budget of 240 million, staff of 1,400, and 460 trucks on the road. A bit of background, I also went to Otomoto Primary School and my parents planted an acre in, uh, of kiwi fruit a little bit before Todd's family in the, late, in the early 60s. But now moving on to the Western Bay story. It's quite an interesting uh, story. The early chapters were a bit of a roller coaster as we came to grips with the 1989 amalgamation. The middle chapters highlighted a period of relative peace where we came up with this great idea of um, fields of the future, but very quickly moved on to paddocks of the past, and ultimately in the early 2000s led to smart growth. The more recent chapters over the global financial crisis and our ability to, get, to steady the ship and work our way through that. We have been through issues like COVID more recently, but we've come through them stronger. But back to smart growth and our plans to remedy our transport and housing issues. In 2017, we saw a change of government. The newly appointed Minister of Transport came and spoke with Doug and, and uh, the then Mayor, Greg Brownless and myself, uh, and Bill Wosley, to say the world had changed. We had to adapt and get into the, the thinking of that organisation. We had a choice to make. We knew what had worked in the past. It was a joined up approach to our, our district. In the early days, the Tauranga Eastern Link was, uh, was delivered by central government. And more recently, the Tauranga Northern Link. So we know how to work together. We know how to work with central government, but we have to do more of it. But working together is a bit like baking a cake. You only know the outcome when you've eaten your first slice. And you know during the process, you had to crack a few eggs and you had to beat the hell out of the mixture on occasions to make sure it was well integrated. And as the judges on my kitchen rules would say, you've, you've proven to us, that's local government in the Bay of Plenty, you can, you can bake a cake. But the cake has got past it, and we now have to look up to a new dessert selection. And we really are expecting ourselves with central government and their agencies to work collaboratively to find a solution for those transport issues and those housing issues. And despite what you're hearing on social media, and I refer to baking a cake, it gets messy in the kitchen and we're starting to see that at the moment. But we've got to get beyond that and we've got to really work, as Todd said, collaboratively in the best interest of the district. It's not about Western Bay versus Tauranga or Tauranga versus the Regional Council or Rotorua. It's all of us working to do what's best. We know what the problems are, it's just finding the solutions. So what is the solution? Well, we've, we've landed on this program called UFTI, Urban Form and Transport Initiative. At this stage, and I stress at this stage, UFTI has the blessing of central government and the, those master chefs, the ministers and, and the bureaucrats, because, and I'll read this, it has taken the strategic vision and priority options of the smart growth partners and central government to a new level. It's a 50 year program broken into three chances, one to 10 years, 10 to 30 years, and 30 to 50 years. It sets the transport functions, objectives, outcomes, and levels of service at a corridor level. And finally, it will develop an agreed funding and financing plan for the implementation programs of both local and central government. Central government, however, has made it crystal clear that they will not deliver on option four, which is the funding package, until we as the local government players land sensibly on the, on the same spot for the first three criteria. In my view, we're at the crossroads. We have to commit to finding a solution. We've talked about it for long enough. We've planned for 20 years. It's now time to do stuff. But Doug, Tenby and myself need the support of the business community. We will not do this local government on its own. We, ha we are committed as a district to working with the business community because that's what's creating a lot of the issues. Um, you know, the growth in the kiwi fruit industry, the success of the port. We have to accommodate those. We need to recognise that as councillors, we are enablers, we are not drivers. Central government has shown support for our 
where we've come to so far in the last six to 18 months. And that's evidenced by the recent 900 million invested in the Tauranga Northern Link. So we know which road we have to go down. And for some, it's going to be a big slice of cake to swallow. But we have to swallow it. We have to take the hard decisions and get on because we know that if we commit to our plan, we will get a more compact re region built around the port and a thriving livable community. We'll have more affordable housing. We will have a really effective, efficient and optimised transport network. We'll have greater access to social, cultural, environmental and economic opportunities. And that achievement, when it all comes together, will be our legacy, this current generation, that future generations will hopefully thank us for. Nōrā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hi everyone, uh, we've just had notice from uh, Dave Courtney from Zespri that he's uh, unable, because of the announcement last night, uh, which is on Thursday evening, uh, that the borders are closing, that they have significant constraints with their temporary uh, staff, that they were getting temporary workers from overseas. So Zespri's uh, in crisis, uh, crisis mode, they've got a bit of a war room set up and he's unable to leave Zespri. So even even within days, within hours, information's changing. Uh, and it really goes to show that it's quite hard for businesses to keep up with the latest information and the latest updates. Um, so please do visit uh, the Tauranga Chamber website where we're keeping, um, we're trying to decipher the information and keep one channel portal updated on a daily basis. So please visit www.tauranga.org.nz. Great. Now, thank you very much for your speeches, um, your, your addresses to the, to the public. It was, um, you covered a lot of things in there. Um, just obviously, uh, we, Tourism Bay of Plenty had a meeting last night where uh, while they're trying to be optimistic, and there's a number of uh, travellers that are saying, look, keep the deposit, we want to come ne next year. Uh, there is optimism for, for the long term, but the short term, there is a lot of pain out there and uh, some operators are talking about 90, 80 to 90% redundancies. Uh, I suppose, uh, start off with, uh, with you, Todd, around particularly with your experience in the kiwifruit sector, um, what would be some advice knowing that kiwifruit, uh, as we just heard, is, uh, is looking to ramp up? Well, <coughs> yes, uh, certainly for those uh, uh, tourist uh, businesses, um, you know, uh, my heart goes out to them. That's a very, very tough position to be in. Uh, when essentially you see your revenue line uh, completely collapse. Mm. Uh, and so there's a couple of uh, things really. I think um, firstly there's the opportunities that they will all be doing to try and think of ways to be able to um, repackage their business in a way that works in a domestic context because I'm sure we're all not going to stay self-isolated self forever. We're going to want to get out and when we get out of that, if that's what our future is, uh, I think New Zealanders will have a high appetite to travel around the country, right? So there is, there will be avenues still to keep the revenue side um, reasonable. Uh, the government has announced uh, some uh, support, particularly in terms of wage uh, support for up to 12 weeks, which I think is a good step, step in the right direction. Uh, who knows, other countries uh, have gone to uh, even more aggressive commitments from the uh, essentially from the state in terms of even bank guarantees. I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen here, but we are, as you've said, in the context yeah. uh, you know, of uh, even this interview today, um, uh, in a very, very fluid uh, situation. Uh, in terms of the, the people side, um, it's, r it's really important to get as close as you can to those who work with you and for you, uh, because people uh, really take it to heart, these sort of challenges. Uh, when I was at Fonterra, we had to go through what was called the botulism scare. Um, my team were front and centre of that response. Uh, and the thing that I learned is that you go through cycles. There's the immediate crisis where you're trying to get through the first sort of handful of days and weeks. And then it sort of comes off the acute crisis and gets into a level of what I call ongoing uh, uh, toughness. But the rest of the business return back to business as usual. But you are still in that tough position. Uh, and some of my team who were in that, um, I actually didn't look after them enough. And I can remember walking into a, they were sort of the war room, but two or three weeks, maybe longer on, and everyone had sort of turned back to normal. And I went and saw these, uh, this, pe these people, and uh, I realised then I'd let them down. They had just, they were, had battled too long alone, 
Uh, and you know, we had people in that group who ended up having heart attacks, who you know had to move on from the business. Uh, and I hold myself accountable for that because you know I didn't get connected enough with all my people uh, and stand alongside them. And so the the leaders of which you know many, mm -hmm. if not all, will be hearing this are leaders in their own right in their businesses and communities. That's part of leadership is acknowledging that you've got to be there with mm -hmm. people uh, and listen. Uh, and empathy can go a long way. Th thanks, Todd. And if I can add to that. As I said, I, I run businesses. Looking after your people is ad absolutely essential. But I think this actually goes a little wider than this. As we as humanitarians look to our neighbours, look to those that, that need a bit of help, now is not the time to, to close the purse strings. Now is the time to make sure that we don't build or the gap between the rich and the poor. Let's make sure we look after those less disadvantaged. And I know in our own, own, own case, and I'm sure Tauranga City and the Regional Council are in the same space. We are big investors in capital projects. We should keep those going because that will keep the concrete workers employed, the people who look after our parks and reserves, the people who do all the, those project work for us, keeps the income coming forward. And we've got to do as much as we can. Now I know there's some will say cut the rates, cut the rates, but we've actually got to look a little wider than ourselves. Those that can afford to pay rates, Maybe the time to say, hey, can I give $10 to somebody who needs a loaf of bread to feed the kids? And I think we've just got to be a little wider than looking after our own patch and say, what can we do to make sure that the wider Bayapliti region, and New Zealand for that matter, comes through this a little bit better off than if we just turned a blind eye to those we did not, don't care about. Well, let's uh, uh, stay with you, um, Mayor Weber. Um, you, both of you have had uh, very strong um, and very uh, diverse careers. Uh, no doubt you, throughout your time, you've come up, um, you've gone through some very difficult times. And what would be your advice to some business owners that ha essentially from Monday had the rug pulled from underneath them and are having to have some very difficult conversations with some staff that perhaps have been there for, for a number of years? Uh, what is your advice to the business owners to look after themselves and perhaps look after their own mental well-being and resilience? Um, <clears throat> yes, unfortunately in my, my career a lot of the automation I talked about meant a lot of people were made redundant. But it was as Todd said, it's making sure that yes you don't like making people redundant, but keep in touch with them. Make sure that they are, they are going through the grieving process, because that's what they go through, to make sure that they do come out as best they can. These are, these are difficult times, but it's, it's like every community, you've got to look after the people. And, and whatever you can do, and, and a lot of that's not money, that's just talking to people, asking them if they're okay. Is there anything we can do? Putting them in the right direction of the people that can help. Because there's a lot of voluntary org organisations throughout our district that will help in this. But don't take it on your own. You know, running a business is not easy. So use those voluntary organisations, use the budgeting advice people. Make sure that the people that have been laid off have got some some support outside of the business, but you too need, you've got a duty of care to these people as well. Phoning them up once a fortnight, saying how are things, and, and just giving that moral support. Mental illness is something we all have to contribute to. I think um, uh, Gary has summed up um, the obligation uh, to assist others superbly. So I'm not going to focus on that. I'll focus on uh, what you can do to look after yourself. Uh, and, uh, when, and all my advice is based on my own experience. And so, you know, take it or leave it, it's just one person's perspective. Uh, but for me, what's the most grounding uh, is my family and the place that I've cho we have chosen to live. Uh, and I anchor myself when I've been in the great stresses of my life, and I've had them, uh, in that moment. Because actually, everything else is temporary, right? And even at the worst of it, if this means that actually your business can't stay as it was and it falls over, even if it means that at the worst, the house that you put up as collateral has to move and you then have to move into rental, I'm talking the worst of it. And there may be people out there uh, who have to experience that and fortunately that's sort of uh, what ends up being you know, what happens to them. I think we've got to say that that is likely to happen to some businesses in this city. 
You can't walk away from that. It's nice to sugarcoat it that it might not happen, but it is likely to happen. And if you find yourself at, in that point, how do you keep yourself resilient? How do you keep yourself optimistic that actually, the, the, the truism as it is, the sun will come up tomorrow? I think you do it by anchoring yourself on the things that ultimately give you sucker, and that is your family and the space in which you've chosen to live. Because this is cyclical. The skills you had to build a business to what it is today are still with you. And what you have through that experience is additional skills of resilience and optimism and the capacity to get up again and try again. Uh, and, in a, and this community, because of its strengths, and this country, because of its natural, many natural advantages, its overall trajectory is sound and positive. So if you can keep yourself in that headspace, however difficult and emotional and tough it is, I think you can get through it. Great. Ah, and for those of you who are watching, yes, we did hand sanitise uh, our guests and the microphone, so don't worry about that. Uh, look, uh, and it was, I'm um, pleased both of you touched on that, given the seriousness of this issue, uh, it's time for solidarity um, across, you know, leave politics aside and let, let's address things, focus on the people um, and the communities that we're all serving. Uh, so. I, I do. Uh, I heard on the radio as I was driving to the Tourism Bay a plenty meeting last night that uh, Mayor Ty Twyford, were, oh, sorry, Minister Twyford was down in Queenstown hearing from uh, tourist operators saying that the 150k cap uh, wasn't an, uh, wasn't going to last our businesses more than a couple of weeks, let alone through the 30th of June. Uh, what further support packages may uh, government be looking to introduce? Um, uh, as part of phase two of the announcements and support packages? It's hard to get visibility on that because uh, obviously in opposition um, you can, uh, you're ultimately at a position to critique to the extent that's appropriate what they ultimately land on. Uh, and you know that was part of our conversation this week is that their package 12 billion, an eye-watering number actually, an eye-watering number. Um, and where the balance of emphasis should be between uh, funding uh, and support for those who do find themselves uh, unemployed versus funding for businesses to keep going so less people end up unemployed. Uh, and as you would expect, uh, with our centre-right philosophy as a party, we have a, a, an understandable and I think very defendable view that the latter should be the greater priority. But now you move to the second um, tranche uh, and uh, that, this then becomes a conversation around how deep is this hole? How long is it going to go for? And to what extent do we continue and should continue to borrow uh, to keep and propping up businesses which may in time certainly recover, but are we prepared to do it for six months? Are we prepared to do it for nine months? If you, do, should you have a bank guarantee? You'll say I'm not answering your question, and I'm sort of not because the problem with this, and this is why I actually uh, th support a a uh, considered, measured, iterative proce in, uh, process here is that you have to work on what you've got in front of you. And so the government did their first, um, their first investment. I think in another couple of three weeks or so they'll have a greater sense of our ability to get through the health uh, uh, crisis. And the extent to which we've managed to flatten the curve should mean that we have less in time uh, constraints in terms of us going about our daily lives which in turn will mean there's um, more options to consider in terms of what to do on the economic package. If we follow the same health trajectory as other countries, that economic package is just going to have to go broader and wider and deeper for longer, uh, and then we will eventually uh, uh, have to reach the point that we'll have to start recovering. Because you can go from debt to GDP of 19% and balloon it up to 50. If that's, if that's required to get through it, in my opinion, so be it. But then you have to start, uh, as a country, once you've stood up everything again, squeezing that debt back down again so you've got yourself into a position uh, to be able to respond when the next rainy day comes. Uh, I promise if you do ask me another question, it won't get that quite long answer. I suppose I, I saw an interesting American program this morning where one of the commentators made the point, let's not bail out the shareholders, bail out the business, but most importantly, look after the people that are made redundant so that they can afford to put food on the table, pay the kids school fees, and if necessary, pay the mortgage. And, and that's the, the space I'm in. Um, and, and I see the position that Todd just talked about. 
Borrowing money is the least of my worries. That's good business practice. It's doing it logically and for the right reasons and making sure that the long-term plan you're focusing on is to get it back in track. And, and I think, you know, Western Bay, Charlotte can do that. We had the high, highest debt um, about eight or nine years ago. We are managing our debt now. Um, it's not easy, but you've got to focus on bailing out the business if that's what you're going to do, not the shareholders. So that's, you know, making sure the cash flow that these businesses have got is, is an, an enough to keep them ticking over. Yes, there's going to be casualties. We just have to face up to that. But it's how do we minimise them and then how do we get the corrective actions in place. And as I said in my presentation, Fakari's been here. The Edgecombe earthquake's been there. We've come through these before and, and we're stronger for it. So it's making sure we learn and get our house in order as quickly as we can. Great. Okay, uh, look, and uh, looking for the long-term recovery, uh, these many economists that are saying that this will be uh, sharper than the GFC but potentially shorter. Uh, and of course, as we as we evolve with new information coming up, uh, it's <laughs> very brave. Uh, but the, in terms of the recovery, what, once we do hit the bottom, uh, what would be um, particular? Well, and I'll ask you for local and central government views. But from for for Gary, uh, in terms of local government and potentially with support with central, what is your perspective on what public sector should be doing to support our recovery? Well, as I made the point earlier, we have a capital program and we need to keep that going. We've had some uh, questions from the Department of Internal Affairs. Is there any project we could actually go a little further to make sure that the economy does continue to take over? I know we're the lenders of last resort and, and, the, and the rate payers might ask the hard questions, but this is bigger than a rate payer issue. This is a humanitarian approach to what can we do to make sure that wherever possible, we are keeping those businesses out there. And most of those businesses are not council-owned businesses. It's the concrete works, it's the tar-making people, it's the people who look after our parks and reserves with the mowers and all that sort of thing. But making sure that they continue to have an income where we ever, ever can contribute. And we're, as our council, we're we've considered that and we've said we will go as hard as we can and as far as we can. Tom? Well, I think when I said at my opening remarks that um, this event is going to be so substantive it'll change New Zealand uh, again fundamentally and we'll remember what it was like pre-COVID uh, uh, and then reflect on the reality post it. I think this um, is one of those areas that is going to um, completely change debt, right? We had an understandable focus, successive governments actually, well I would argue particularly the key English one, uh, to get debt to GDP down to what was roughly around 20%, one of the best um, uh, in the uh, Western world. And now, in the space of a few weeks, the government has announced $12 billion on infrastructure spending uh, and uh, $12 billion currently, uh, with every expectation that's going to go seriously north, uh, uh, to try and get us through this. And so, um, I think, and then you look at other countries around the world who have worse debt to, jet, debt to GDP positions, much, much worse than ours, and they are throwing the kitchen sink uh, at their economies to keep them up. And so I think, therefore, New Zealanders are going to look at that and say, our strong focus of getting debt down to a particular level was good. We needed that because now we've had some capacity to, to be there on a day like this. But should we not now build... Uh, look at not immediately trying to screw that debt back down again, but look at opportunities to actually perhaps um, uh, take on even a little bit more debt uh, to enable the economy to recover in terms of serious infrastructure rebuild. We know that the infrastructure deficit in this country is enormous, not just here in this city, and I won't be partisan around why I think that's the case. It's a, it's a, a you know, ultimately a many year generational kind of issue. I think you can argue that's across the country. I think you know our people need investment to have the skills to be uh, successful, and then. But what is the enabling infrastructure? You know, it is roads, it's in connectivity, all that sort of stuff across the country. But that's going to take a huge amount of spend, and if you've already taken on an enormous amount of debt to recover to get yourself through COVID, how are we then going to have a conversation around appetite to take on more debt to rebuild the country? You know, and my point is. 
four weeks ago you couldn't even imagine having that conversation, but now I suspect they will be the conversations we'll need to have. Uh, but, and I think my personal instinct is that we've got to lean into it, that we'll have five million people who will want to get this country up and running and back to where we want it to be, and if that means that we take on a bit more debt relative to what we historically would have done, so be it. Great. Oh, well, um, I think that wraps it up. Uh, we've, uh, th that was a fairly lengthy discussion and very robust, and I very much appreciate um, both of you uh, speaking pretty free and frankly and addressing this audience. Look, uh, as we go through this tough time, uh, a lot of businesses will be facing very different situations and very different pain points, whether it's supply chains, business continuity, uh, human resources, or just tech cash flow and financial uh, issues. Look, there is a lot of uh, resources available. Please do visit uh, www.tauranga.org.nz. There is a lot of information there. We've got business advisors uh, and support um, opportunities throughout the membership with a bunch of professional providers as well. We can connect you to the right people. Please get in touch. I thank you uh, both Todd and Gary. Thank you for turning up. Uh, thanks uh, Dave. We know that you're here in spirit um, and all the best. Um, yeah, please keep in touch.